So John, tell me a little bit about maybe therapy. I mean, I think that's our area of expertise. So um, we talked a little bit about, you know, watch and wait, et cetera, but, you know, um, somatostat analogs, I think they continue to remain sort of the, uh, the uh, mainstay of our treatment. Uh, maybe just give our audience a little bit of an overview about somatostat analogs since sure. we use them so much. So uh, there are two that are primarily used for um, uh, gastroenteropancreatic and lung nets. Those are, of course, uh, octreotide, sandostatin, and lanreotide somatulene. Uh, somatostatin analogs have been around for several decades. I think the first FDA approval was around 1985. Uh, initially, they were used for control of hormonal symptoms, uh, particularly carcinoid syndrome, but it was um, you know, fairly quickly understood that they uh, also control tumor growth. But it took several decades to prove that. And the first study that, that showed that was a PROMID study, a study of midgut nets, predominantly low grade, um, uh, where patients were randomized to receive octreotide 30 milligrams versus placebo, showing a very significant improvement in time to progression. The median time to progression improved from six months on placebo to over 14 months uh, with, with octreotide. So that was a positive study. Then came the clarinet study, which looked at a more diverse group of enteropancreatic nets, evaluating lanreotide, 120 milligrams versus placebo, uh, with PFS as a primary endpoint. And in this particular study, which enrolled patients with extremely slow-growing tumors, the median progression-free survival in placebo was 18 months, uh, but it was not reached at the time of publication with lanreotide, and the hazard ratio was roughly 0.5. So, so both studies showed a very significant prolongation in, in progression-free survival, which is really the, the primary endpoint, despite having extremely low objective response rates. So we know that somatostatin analogs not only control hormonal symptoms in the large majority of cases, but they also significantly inhibit tumor growth. Now, they're not going to actually shrink tumors, uh, but they can, um, they can significantly delay time to progression. Um, the clarinet study required um, somatostatin receptor expression on octreoscan. The PROMIT study did not, but uh, we know that almost all midgut uh, nets are somatostatin receptor positive. So this is primarily a treatment, I think, for uh, somatostatin receptor uh, positive tumors. And it's typically a first-line systemic treatment. And the reason it's first-line is, is because these drugs are exceptionally well-tolerated. Uh, patients can experience a little bit of gas and bloating uh, they have increased risk of gallstones. Um, one thing we find is that patients can experience diarrhea or steatorrhea, which can often be controlled with um, uh, pancreatic enzymes such as Creon. But we're talking about very low-risk drugs, probably the, the least risky drugs that are used in the, the entire oncology sphere. So I would say that typically we're talking about, you know, first-line first line treatment. Can you talk a little bit about how these drugs, uh, how, how they're similar and, and maybe a little bit about how they're different and whether, whether you have any preference for one or another, or whether patients exper express a preference for, for either of the drugs. You know, there's just all this debate about, you know, are these a class effect uh, and can we interchange one for the other? And I have to say I'm of the opinion that yes, they probably are uh, very similar and we can probably interchange them for one or the other. Um, you know, uh, octreotide is, a, is an IM injection uh, given once every four weeks. Um, lanreotide is what we call a deep sub-Q, uh, also given once every four weeks with standard dosing. Uh, there's small differences in the, sites, uh, the size of the needles, et cetera, but um, generally I find them to be quite similar and I don't really have a specific preference for one or the other. How about you? Do you have a preference for one or the other in terms of any clinical situations or...? No, I agree. They're extremely similar. Um, nurses might have a little bit of an easier time administering uh, lanreotide um, because it comes in a pre-filled syringe. Um, but uh, as far as the patient experience with the drug, I'm not sure that there's, there's much difference between the two. And of course, we haven't had a modern study comparing them. So, um, um, so, so there's, no, there's no comparative evidence. If you look at the hazard ratio, though, for for mid-gut nets on the clarinet study, it's virtually identical to what was seen in the prone mid study. So I think that as far as efficacy, they're probably extremely similar, and they target the same somatostatin receptor subtypes. They primarily target uh, SSTR2. Uh, so uh, as far as pathophysiology and the clinical evidence that we have so far, I don't think we can say that one is, is, is better than the other. Nor can we say that uh, there's any advantage to switching from one to another at the time of disease progression.
Uh, one thing we didn't we we touched upon though is um, is changes in in dose, and um, a fairly common circumstance I find is that uh, patients can experience syndrome control for for three weeks, but then sort of an exacerbation for the last week of the four week cycle. In which case, it makes a lot of sense to give the drug every three weeks rather than every four weeks. And sometimes we go go up on the dose and and see benefit. Um, we do that primarily for, for sin, symptom control. I'm not sure that there's much evidence that it helps improve tumor control. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that it's definitely useful for symptom control. Um, I think uh, there is probably uh, a fair amount of use of uh, the drug as well for, uh, beyond the, the dose that we're used to for tumor control. I don't think that has been studied as of yet. And I think it's an interesting question, though, because as you were saying, these drugs are extremely well tolerated, so we want to make sure that we're using them uh, to their maximum advantage before we move on to potentially more toxic agents. Right.